Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us tonight. My name is Nick Black. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of the Boston Waterfront Initiative. Uh, we still got a lot of folks joining us tonight. Uh, so we're going to give it just a couple minutes to let folks get logged in and uh, part of the meeting. Uh, we are going to be using all of Zoom's uh, features this evening to uh, make this as interactive as, and conversational as possible. So we definitely want to hear from folks. So uh, to start, uh, go ahead and open up the chat box, uh, say hello to uh, your fellow participants, um, and if you'd like, tell us what your New Year's resolution was, and if you'd also like, tell us whether or not you've kept your New Year's resolution. Uh, my personally was well, workout related. I'm a little behind in terms of the meters road that I wanted to have road at this point in the year, but um, we'll, we'll get there. So open up your chat box, say hi. We'll be using that to take some Q&A as well. We'll be opening it up at the end to uh, answer questions, hear feedback. Uh, as you can say, we, we got a pretty good group here tonight, so we're excited for that. Uh, so we'll get started here in just two minutes, but uh, don't be shy, say hello. Hi, John. Hi, Alex. Great to see you both. Hi, Mary. I spend a lot of time on Zooms with John and Alex, so I sympathize with them. Richard's going to walk more. Uh, that's also a good idea. The weather's been good so far. Hopefully that persists for some time. Hey, Rick. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. It's not too late to make a New Year's resolution if you don't have one yet, but I won't hold it against you if you don't. Hi, Kimberly. Thanks for joining us. All right, well, it's three after six o'clock. We've got a really great group here tonight. I'm really excited uh, the interest and participation from everyone. Uh, again, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Nick Black. I'm the managing director at the uh, of the Boston Waterfront Initiative at the Trustees of Reservations. Uh, we're very excited for to, to be here tonight with all of you. I uh, do want to start just with a few housekeeping notes. Um, we are recording this meeting. Uh, it's also being broadcast live on Facebook. Uh, if you don't wish to be recorded, uh, just keep your camera turned off and yourself on mute. And uh, we'll be keeping everyone muted for the first portion of the presentation here. And then as we move to the Q&A function, we'll allow folks to participate uh, by raising your hand. Um, if you hit the participants bo uh, button at the, the bottom there, a box will pop up and give you the option to click on raise your hand when we get there. Uh, if you don't want to raise your hand, you can also just type a, a, a question into the chat box here that we'll be going back to uh, throughout the evening. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and keep track of everyone that way. Uh, just to note that uh, tomorrow we're hosting a very similar meeting um, uh, tomorrow night as well. Uh, but that's going to be held entirely in Spanish. So if there are anyone who is interested in participating in a Spanish language version of this meeting, uh, same time tomorrow night, you can also sign up for that on our website. Um, do want to just start with a few thank yous and acknowledgments this evening. Uh, first, for uh, our East Boston elected officials, um, uh, Senator Boncourt, Rep. Madaro, and, and uh, Councilor Edwards have all been uh, instrumental in getting us to this point. We're really grateful for their participation. Uh, if uh, any of them or their staff or representatives are on tonight, go ahead and, and stick a hand up. And if you want to say hello, we can give you a, a minute or so to do that. Uh, so I'll just give Amy uh, a, a chance to, to scan to see if any of those folks are available. 
Uh, secondly, I also want to uh, say hello to the Fierce PAC, uh, who we've worked with, Luis Montanino, uh, the president of the PAC, I believe, uh, is joining us tonight. Great to see you, Lulu. Thank you for being here and, and all of our other PAC members. Uh, also, just want to say thanks to, to Massport. Obviously, CEO Lisa Wheeland has, has uh, been a big supporter of this project moving forward and a big reason why this is happening. Uh, I know both uh, Anthony Guerrero and Gordon Carr from the Massport team are joining us. Um, and I think we'll hear from Anthony here in just a second. So uh, any uh, elected officials, anyone else that we missed, I should acknowledge. Okay, great. We'll just keep moving then. Uh, just on, on the trustee side of things, wanted to say hello, first and foremost, from Jocelyn Forbush. She's our executive vice president joining us here tonight. Uh, I'm here with uh, my team, Amy I Nation. She's uh, my project manager, uh, is going to be helping us with the Q&A, uh, is an Eagle Hill resident, uh, originally from Dorchester, um, and glad to have her here. Uh, we also have Chris Donahue and the team from Michael Van Valkenburg Associates joining us. Uh, you'll hear quite a bit from Chris uh, in, in the over the next few minutes. Uh, but just uh, wanted to, to start with uh, Anthony from Massport, if you wanted to say a few words, um, uh, just to say hello to folks tonight, and, and we'll get into the, the meat of the program. Do we have Anthony unmuted? Can you hear me now, Nick? Yes, we yeah. got you. Hi, okay. Anthony. How are you? Good to Nick, see you. Nice to see you. Good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of Lisa Whelan, Massport CEO, we're very excited about this prospect of building phase three of Pierce Park and working with the trustees. I think you're going to be very um, excited uh, about this uh, design and this process. The trustees have a terrific reputation throughout the Commonwealth. And we look forward to their partnership, working with them closely, and as well as the East Boston Peer Pack and the rest of the East Boston community. All told, between Pierce, Pack one, Pierce Park 1, Phase 2 that we're currently um, in development in Phase 3, you're talking about over 15 acres of open space on the East Boston waterfront, which is unheard of anywhere else in Boston. So this is really going to be a special place and a special time going through this process. So Nick, good luck tonight. Uh, Gordon and I will be on this call. So at the end of the uh, meeting, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, again, some uh, deep appreciation for Massport in, in terms of the partnership that they've shown to get us to the, this point in this project. We're, we're really quite excited about it. Uh, so our main goal for this evening really is to hear from all of you. We've got, uh, looks like almost 100 people on the call tonight. So this is a really exciting opportunity for us to do just that. Um, we also like to spend a little bit of time talking about who we are, the trustees as an organization, as well as what got us to this point. Uh, then Chris is going to provide us with some inspiration for conversation uh, before we open it up to you, our participants, for uh, questions and comments and feedback. Uh, I do want to be clear here at the beginning, we're not presenting any design options tonight. Uh, we've done a significant amount of research into what we think is possible here at Pierce Park Phase 3, but we're really at the beginning of this design process. And I want to give everyone a chance to weigh in uh, before we move forward with the design. And uh, this is really just the first of, of several meetings that we're going to be hosting throughout the year uh, that will all take on different forms. Hopefully, at some point, we'll all be able to get together in person. Um, but I really appreciate uh, people participating in the, in the Zoom call this evening. Uh, if you have seen us before at either the October Pierce PAC meeting or some of the other East Boston Neighborhood Association or Council meetings, uh, some of what we'll be presenting tonight will sound familiar to you. Uh, but our hope tonight is to get more in depth in the opportunities and have plenty of time to hear your ideas and your hopes for this particular project. Um, throughout this conversation, we'll be asking for your participation. Uh, we'll have a number of pop-up polls, uh, which helps to gather some feedback uh, and um, let us know uh, what you're th thinking and feeling about the, this particular project. Uh, but just to begin, the uh, Trustees of Reservations, we're uh, America's oldest in Massachusetts land conservation organization. Uh, we were actually founded in Boston about 130 years ago and have properties that consist of everything from hiking trails to working farms to historic homes, beaches and coastal properties. Uh, and in fact, we're the largest private owner of protected coastline in the Commonwealth with uh, over 125 miles of coastline under our care. 
Uh, it, with 125 reservations across the Commonwealth, uh, we typically welcome over 2 million visitors annually uh, and have about a quarter of a million people participate in over 5,000 programs uh, in any given year. Um, as you can see from this map, our reservations are spread out all across the Commonwealth with some concentrations up on the North Shore as well as on the, the Charles River Valley. Uh, with reservations from Pittsfield to Provincetown, every uh, resident of Massachusetts is in within a 15 minute drive of one of our special places. Uh, some of our best known reservations include the Crane Estate in Ipswich, uh, Decorder Sculpture Park and Museum in Lincoln, uh, Monument Mountain out in Great Barrington, the Cabot Bradley Estate in Canton, Nomkeg in Stockbridge, and World's End in Hingham, amongst many, many others. Uh, our presence here in Boston, the, the Charles Elliott actually founded the trustees in 1890 way, or 1891, excuse me, as a way for residents for what at the time was a rather dirty city of Boston to find a way to escape. Um, the Boston Waterfront Initiative's focus today, more than a century later, is to continue this important work and create new places within the city of Boston for residents to enjoy much closer to home. Uh, we currently operate 56 community gardens in the neighborhoods across the city that provide uh, vital food access to residents in underserved areas. And um, uh, including two of them that are in Eastie, the Eagle Hill Community Garden, as well as the Joe Ciampa Garden, which is right across the street from Pierce Park, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Additionally, we operate a Seaport CSA and a mobile farmers market that serve city residents and commuters from Dorchester to Jamaica Plain to Roxbury and beyond. And one of my personal goals for 2021 is to get the mobile market into the East Boston neighborhood so residents can take advantage of it there. Uh, the 120 miles of coastline that the, trust, the, the trustees own to protect does include six beaches, 60 miles of coastal trails, properties of significant ecological value that are home to numerous threatened and endangered species. Uh, the trustees are also leading an effort to think about how we in Massachusetts are responding to a changing coast as we face the threats of sea level rise and storm surge in the coming years. Uh, this includes a, a, an annual publication called State of the Coast, uh, which is a report over the next several years that explores the climate impacts on the coastal zone communities from the North Shore to the South Coast, spotlighting current strategies and proposing future opportunities. Uh, before we get to the heart of the program, we do want to hear from you, though. Uh, again, using your chat box here, uh, tell us what city or town you're joining us from. If you're from Boston, what neighborhood are you joining us from? Uh, first, saying hello to Stephen Gingras from Rep uh, Madro's office. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. And uh, again, for the representative support to, to, to get us here. Uh, again, hello, John from East Boston, Mike from Quincy. Uh, good to see folks from Eagle Hill, Somerville, Orion Heights, lots of Eastie folks. This is great to see. Thank you so much. Jeffrey's Point, uh, Orion Heights again, East Boston, uh, Cambridge, Eagle Hill, always a North End restaurant or resident, I should say. Keith, hello. Charlestown, Situate, good to see someone from the South Shore uh, on here tonight. Um, this is great. We really appreciate you guys all taking the time to be here. Keep keep shouting it out, but I'm going to keep going. Otherwise, this might take a while because we got a lot of you on here tonight. Um, the waterfront vision and what we're actually really here to talk about tonight is is this piece that the trustees have been working on going on about five years now. But uh, the, the, the vision for the waterfront is part of our five-year strategic plan uh, that charts the course of our organization going forward to 2023. Uh, our goal with the Waterfront Initiative is to create a network of public green open space around the heart of Boston's Harbor that achieves really three things. We're really looking to create world-class destinations that supports the need of diverse communities and increases access to the waterfront. And that does so that in a way that brings real value to Boston's climate resiliency goals and is ultimately financially feasible, both in its uh, creation and, and long term. Uh, and so early on in this process, uh, in the initiative, we saw the potential in East Boston to achieve all of those things, specifically here at the Pierce Park Complex. Uh, the trustees originally responded to Massport's request for proposals in 2017 to design and construct Pierce Park Phase 2, 
Our original concept included a plan for the derelict pile field that stuck out from the land that we've now come to know as Pierce Park Phase 3. Uh, we weren't selected as the designers for Phase 2, but we did maintain a conversation with Massport around the possible feasibility and opportunity for creating additional park space at Phase 3. Uh, in 2018, we responded to an RFP that Massport issued for a not-for-profit public-private partner to develop par Pierce Park Phase 3 in both design and construction, as well as uh, long-term operations and maintenance. Um, the initial concept that we submitted to Massport was really full of uncertainties and questions. Uh, there was just simply a lot about this site that we didn't know. Uh, so we took the intervening months to do more homework and to learn more about the site and again better understand what the opportunity would be here at this unique place. Uh, Chris will go into more of that and did some detail uh, but throughout 2019 we conducted an in-depth site investigation to better understand the conditions of the pier and to better respond to Massport's proposal with the idea of what we thought might be possible. After much conversation and deliberation the Massport Board of Directors did designate the trustees as the site developer for Pierce Park Phase 3. And uh, we're very excited to be here tonight to start this conversation with the community about what the opportunities and the challenges are gonna be in turning this pier into a world-class park. Ultimately, the, the basis and the foundation for this project is the concept of industrial reuse. And that's the act of taking a post-industrial site and reimagining it as accessible public open space. Uh, the image you see here is from nearly a century ago, and it shows the Pierce Park complex as it once was, a bustling connection of goods and people from all over the world. One of our objectives with this site uh, or with this project will be to better understand the history of the site and to work with the community to tell its story. The light colored warehouse that you see on the right here is what Pierce Park 3 looked like in 1925. We're also aware of and sensitive to the fact that East Boston faces many issues and hardships right now, particularly around affordable housing, food insecurity and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with that in mind, we plan to move this project forward under an equitable development framework that will help us understand some of the unintended consequences of creating new open space and uh, thoughtfully identify ways to ensure residents of East Boston stand to benefit rather than face harm from our efforts. And so we're excited to, to develop those and talk about those in, in future meetings as well. Uh, I'm going to turn over here to Chris in just a minute, but before we do that, our, our first opportunity for interaction would love to take a quick poll question for you. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. Uh, how often do you visit Pierce Park? Um, had, are you a daily visitor, one of those joggers that walks through the park? Or do you go there once a week, monthly, only occasionally? Never. I'm kind of interested to hear from the Never Camp as to why you haven't been there and discovered this hidden jewel. Um, as well, some of the other activities that people uh, participate and engage in there. I was last in Pierce Park on New Year's Eve. Uh, we participated in Boston Harbor Now's uh, ice sculpture stroll and, and had some ice sculptures along with Pierce Park Sailing Center, uh, which was a lot of fun, even though it was a little brisk out there. Um, but it was still a nice day to, to have an ice sculpture here. So looks like a, a really nice kind of bell curve of, of users here. We've got a good chunk of daily and weekly users, as well as the monthly and occasional users. Um, as well as 10 never users. So we're looking forward to getting those 10 folks um, out to Pierce Park um, as well as these parks develop and we move this process forward. So thank you for uh, responding to that. Uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Donahue. Uh, he's the associate principal at Michael Van Valkenburg Associates, uh, one of the leading ar landscape architecture firms in the world. Uh, we're very excited. Chris has been with us on this journey from the beginning, and uh, he's going to walk us through some of the ideas that we're bringing to the table tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really excited, as Nick has said, to be at this stage of the project. Um, we've been working with trustees and Massport for quite some time now uh, to sort of get to know the peer. Um, and and to sort of begin thinking about ways that we might turn this old pier into a new public landscape. 
um, we're thrilled to be at this early stage of design and talking with all of you and to learn a little bit more about your goals and your aspirations for the project. Um, as Nick said, uh, my name is Chris Donahue. I've been with MVVA for 12 years, give or take, and I'll be leading the design effort from our side. Um, so I think that this will probably be the first of many conversations that um, we'll have together uh, through the design and construction of this project. Um, also joining me tonight um, are Roberto Ransom and John Maxson from MVVA. Uh, you'll get to know them throughout this process as well. They will, um, you know, as we continue to have these meetings, I'm sure that we'll have more sort of breakout groups and focus working sessions that they will also lead. And they, they've they also been an integral to, um, you know, the process throughout this, or, or through the sort of design and investigation process as we've um, been moving along here. Um, so with this initial meeting, uh, I thought it was important that you sort of got to know who we are and, and what we do as a firm, um, sort of our, our thinking and our ethos on, on landscape and what we might bring, bring to this process. Um, some of you probably already know us a little bit, um, you know, MBVA or Michael Van Valkenburg Associates from our work over on the Fort Point channel. This photo up on the screen is uh, our Martins Park project um, completed just about a year ago. Uh, it's just a single acre, but I think it's an extremely important part of the, of, of Boston um, and a real landmark landscape. It's one that I'm really proud to have been a part of making. Um, the park was created to, be, to celebrate the life of Martin Richard. He was the youngest victim of the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing. Um, and we did that by creating a universally accessible and inclusive playground. It was designed to be comfortable, immersive and exciting for children of all ages. Um, I was the project manager and lead designer for Martins Park, so this project is particularly close to me and, and my heart, but um, one of my favorite aspects of, of working on it um, was seeing how important, how important this project was to the greater community as well. Um, throughout the process, uh, I was struck by the community's appetite to engage in the process of, of design and, and providing their thoughts and their feedback as we were putting this together. Um, so I look forward to more of that kind of energy here at Pierce Park 3. Um, the park has become a really important piece and piece or sort of the soul of the Fort Point and Seaport district, districts. Um, it's of course a, a vibrant landscape of play, a sort of playground, um, but it's equally important as a public landscape and a connector from the Fort Point neighborhood to the larger community. Um, the bridge that's pictured here is a critical connector between sort of two adjacent play areas on the north and side, south sides of the playground, but um, it also allows for people to pass to and from the existing harbor walk uh, to get to one of the most defining characteristics of the greater Boston landscape. And I think that's our adjacency to the harbor. Um, the interior of the park, as I was saying, serves as sort of a robust playground, but the park also provides a welcoming and connective waterfront promenade. Um, so we're really sort of getting to know and have been part of working with the harbor for quite some time. Um, we've been working on Boston's tidal waterfront for years now, and we've developed a sort of keen understanding of the relationship between land and water here in Boston and just how important it is to develop a robust and resilient edge. Um, it's far from our first waterfront landscape, though. Um, some of you may have also be familiar with Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, this is we have an office in Brooklyn as well. Um, pictured here just a few years ago, while this was still partially under construction. Um, similar to our work at Piers Park Three, the the Brooklyn Bridge Park project sought to breathe new life into a former former industrial pier along a tidal waterfront. Um, the design offers many different interpret interpretations of this challenge. Uh, some peers sort of embrace the flatness of, of a pier and a pre-existing structure to bring public sport courts out to the waterfront, um, while other peers or other pieces of the park sought to create more robust public landscapes. Um, pier one pictured here took advantage of its upland connections to develop a series of immersive landscapes um, and landscapes, some of them are open lawns for events and gatherings. Um, 
Others are sort of lifted landscapes that take advantage of views across the, the harbor and, and toward the Manhattan skyline. Um, and a constructed salt marsh at the water's edge to reintroduce native habitats and bolster the park's uh, resilience in the face of sea level rise. <clears throat> um, some of our other projects here, this is Pier C. Uh, again, sort of New York City area, but um, over on, on the Hoboken side of the river. Uh, here we were char charged with sort of creating an, an entirely new pier. There wasn't an existing structure, um, but it too had a sort of focus on play and engaging the, the city's adjacency to the water. Um, <clears throat> in this park, you know, in addition to the playgrounds, Pier C offers city views, a fishing pier, and an active promenade on, in Hoboken where public green space was scarce and desperately needed. <clears throat> this is Hudson River Park. It's the last example of our work that I'll show tonight, um, but I thought worth sort of giving you guys a taste of the kinds of things that we do, the variety of, of public waterfronts that we seek to, you know, um, bring to a Pierce Park 3 kind of project. Um, it helps to sort of illustrate the experience within our firm that will help us to develop a similarly robust urban landscape here. Um, similar to the park that we built in Hoboken, Hudson River Park offers a flexible waterfront green space in an area where green space was extremely limited and demand was extremely high. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> connectivity to an existing chain of urban landscapes and bikeways also played a really critical role in developing the design of this project. Um, again, much like the, the issues of connectivity, it appears Park 1 and 2 that will play a role in our process here. Um, so now looking back at East Boston and specifically our site on Boston's Inner Harbor, uh, at MVVA, you know, we're really excited. We see tremendous potential, potential in this site. Um, the structure of the pier is, of course, a fascinating piece of the site's history. But it's equally fascinating um, in our sort of first read and zooming out to see the site's sort of central location in the city. Um, you know, our partnership with trustees and Massport presents an, an amazing opportunity, I think, to develop a vision for this site that's framed around our shared interests in resilience um, and engagement with the harbor is one of the city's most critical assets. It's just going to be a huge part of this project. Um, the project site, sort of zooming in here, <clears throat> occupies roughly four and a half acres in the footprint of the old pier. Um, it's one that I'm sure you guys are all um, acutely familiar with due to its proximity to Piers Park and, and your community. Uh, <clears throat> the Piers Park one and the conceptual plans for phase two offer really beautiful, generously scaled civic lawns for gathering in a mix of active and passive landscapes um, with a wide range of potential programming opportunities. Um, <clears throat> Pierce Park One also offers really incredible views across the harbor to the Boston city skyline and, and beyond. Um, and a lot of comfortable seating for places for taking in views on a nice day. Um, you know, in the current condition, Piers Park 2 hasn't been built. Uh, the existing pier in the footprint of Piers Park 3 is sort of out of the way and not really a distraction. But, you know, when Piers Park 2 is realized, uh, that sort of relationship will change um, and the need to address 3 will really come into focus. Um, what was once an abandoned pier off to the side of a beautiful Piers Park 1 will now be directly at the center of the, of the greater Piers Park landscape. And it'll be the foreground to the views of the harbor and the city beyond. <clears throat> um, you know, that welcoming entry promenade that, uh, you know, we most of us access Piers Park through will sort of be a, a central spine to a larger landscape and views and, you know, that that central access point will terminate in views of a dilapidated structure rather than the harbor. Um, <clears throat> so now looking at the existing structure of the pier itself, um, you know, we're excited to take on the challenge of examining this, this structure and, and seeing what it can yield. Um, we're excited to reimagine potential futures for the site uh, and, and be, you know, just starting to think about replacing it with a public landscape that, that doesn't just act as a foreground to the views of the harbor, but one that engages the harbor and, and potentially provides a really unique experience um, here in East Boston. 
um, you know, we're thinking about ways that this can be transformed into uh, a really robust and resilient public space. We see a lot of opportunity to create a park that's welcoming and comfortable, but also like actively working to protect the East Boston community from sea level rise and storm surge flooding. That'll just be a really central part of this project, we think. Um, we think we can address some of that need by reintroducing native ecologies. You know, we, we, we believe that a resilient edge can be an incredibly beautiful one. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, just a, a, a static flood barrier, but one that can be made of living materials um, and provide really unique opportunities to reintroduce habitat along the city's edge. Um, we think there's lots of opportunity to envision a park with you all that offers experiences and programs that are complementary to the ones offered at Pierce Park One and Two. Um, you know, we're really excited by really robust pockets of nature, um, and excited by you know opportunities to create immersive moments that are sort of escapes within the city. <clears throat> um, or similarly scaled, intimately scaled terraces or rocky outcroppings um, that sort of, sort of form informal gathering places, places to settle and ones that feel, you know, a little bit nestled and, and tucked in, but also offer elevated and dramatic views out over the harbor. <clears throat> um, we see just tremendous opportunity to engage the water's edge in ways that are safe and welcoming, um, you know, ways that might be complementary to the existing services and programs available at Pierce Park Sailing Center. Um, and, you know, we, we, of course, believe that in all of this thinking through the design, um, that landscape just has just a tremendous capacity to welcome and engage members of all members of the community. Um, it's really critical that this park and the vision for it is one that's born out of, of a robust and meaningful dialogue with the East Boston community, especially, um, you know, all of you on this call and, and everyone else that'll be involved throughout this process so that it becomes one that's loved by all of its future users. Um, we think that it needs to celebrate a, a diverse community uh, and that you know, sometimes that happens and it's born out of the public process, especially. Uh, this photo represents, um, this is the Picnic Peninsula at Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, and it represents one of those successes that comes out of a meaningful dialogue um, in the community process. The, the public grills were something that came up frequently during the, the public feedback process. Um, and as a, as a result, they are just incredibly well loved and one of the most active and diverse, diversely populated areas of the park. Um, as Nick mentioned, you know, we, we've been looking at this site, not from a design standpoint yet, but trying to sort of wrap our head around the opportunities and constraints that it presents for a project like this one. Um, so the image attached describes the sort of land survey that we uh, that we commissioned for this project, um, you know, documenting all the physical features, not just of our immediate site, but of the context surrounding it so that we could better understand its adjacencies. Um, this hydrographic survey represents a sort of contour mapping of the harbor floor adjacent to our immediate site. Um, you know, and, and though we can't necessarily get into and under the, the, the pier itself because of the danger of being under a pier that's mid collapse. <laughs> um, what we can see is, is a sort of standard or, or typical relationship where there's um, sort of deep channels on either side of the pier and it's, it slopes up quite sharply on either side. Um, it's not uncommon for this kind of, this kind of um, waterfront edge. We've also taken a really close look at the marine life in and around the project site. Um, it was important for us to understand what's currently living here so that we, number one, you know, we make sure we're not disturbing rare or endangered habitats. And number two, make sure that the decisions um, we make about habitat creation or enhancement are appropriate to the kinds of creatures living here currently. Um, this particular step of the research phase was, um, was really interesting and I think a reaffirming one. 
Uh, we're happy to report that while the site's not just completely devoid of marine life, um, there's no signs of anything rare or endangered. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity to build on and enhance the marine habitat with this project. Um, <clears throat> We, of course, took a really close look at the existing structure and a sort of structural analysis, um, <clears throat> a sort of micro scaled uh, understanding of, of what the opportunities or limitations of potential reuse might look like for the structure. Um, you know, at Brooklyn Bridge Park, so many of the most formative decisions we made about the peers and, and their potential programmings were informed largely by, you know, the structural capacity and the condition of the existing peers. Um, our, our team of engineers then used their sort of close examination one to one of the peers to develop a series of overall cross sections so that we could better understand the relationship between the pier and the ground below. Because the site is not just the elevation of the pier, but really the whole cross section. Um, and then they looked closely at the condition of the piles and the supporting superstructure um, in an effort to determine opportunities for potential reuse. Uh, this image here, this color-coded image, represents their efforts to classify areas of the pier that might be suitable for reuse with limited capacity and weight restrictions. Um, it'll come as no surprise to most of you probably, but much of the pier is in a state of disrepair that makes it largely unsuitable for rehab without significant and potentially cost prohibitive measures. Um, but not something that we're not at least thinking about still. Um, you know, so then after all that, we, you know, we return to the site as, as the landscape architects and, and design leads who are just itchy to jump in here. Um, with all this granular and sort of technical data swirling through our heads, we, we return to the site in an attempt to process this information, help to formulate some initial goals or aspirations for the project. Um, those goals are loosely represented in this image that many, if not all of you, will have seen in the Globe or other publications. Um, it's really important to note that this is not a not a design, but sort of a, a polished up collage of the kinds of things that we believe to be possible. Um, you know, ways to engage the water, a resilient and eco ecological edge and a variety of landscape experiences with the city and harbor views. Um, <clears throat> the next steps of developing this vision will involve an intensely collaborative process, um, one that revolves around the dialogue beginning, you know, tonight between the parties gathered here. Um, Massport will, of course, be a critical part of this process as the property owners. Trustees will be the sort of managing entity and, and run this community engagement process as we're doing now. Um, uh, we, of course, look forward to the East Boston community's um, participation to help sharing, you know, your goals and your visions for the park. And that at MVVA, it'll sort of be our job to synthesize these thoughts into, um, you know, as the design lead and the landscape architects to create a world-class park. Um, the, so that's sort of the core group but it's far from the entire team working to shape the vision for Piers Park 3. Um, we're supported by a really large and diverse team of consultants, engineers, and specialists pictured here in blue, each of them bringing a different area of expertise to ensure that whatever shape this park takes, it's enduring, it's safe, it's experientially rich, it's resilient, and that it is, of course, an asset to the East Boston community. So what does this process process look like and how do we make sure that you know it represents the East Boston community and at in the end the built landscape um, you know we started with a really robust program of research and analysis that we sort of went through quickly just now um, to better understand the existing site uh, we're just beginning this to focus on the design this project kickoff that we're in right now um, this is a process that will start with really broad stroke concepts um, and then get narrowed down through a rigorous process of engineering, programming, and community review. Um, and then it'll go on to be detailed and documented for construction. <clears throat> um, but it's also a process that's just chock full of community engagement milestones. You know, this doesn't happen in a vacuum and 
these decisions aren't just made at our offices. Um, we believe in a truly engaging and active process of working through these ideas and aspirations with you all, the people who will be using this park the most, um, the members of the community. So we see this process of having, as having lots of check-ins and opportunities for discussions and comments and critique from all of you um, and ways for the community to stay informed and, uh, and up to date as we move into design and documentation and construction. Um, you know, this process looks different depending on who's running it and, wh and what the project looks like. Um, at MVVA, we've always found it the, to be just the most engaging and the most fun to gather around large models and, and activities where we're able to talk directly, you know, to the members of the community and, and with each other about the goals and aspirations for the, the project site. Um, we really love this kind of venue because it provides a way for us to get to know you and also a way for you to, you know, better get to know us. Um, models are just so much fun and and really engaging tools for these kinds of discussions because you can sort of get lean down and, and get yourself into the space by crouching at the table and then, and then ask questions about the landscapes that you know you're then immersing yourselves into um we think it's really important that people of all ages are part of this process young old and especially children um, this will be their neighborhood park and a place that they grow up visiting and, and learning for, from, frankly. Um, so, you know, while we understand that the face-to-face -face interaction isn't super easy right now, um, as you can see, we're, we're working hard to develop many additional ways to facilitate these kinds of conversations um, that often play such a critical role in our process. Uh, we look forward to when we can safe, all safely gather around a model again, hopefully sooner than later, um, and begin to talk about design developments. Uh, but we realize that we're going to need to make these kind of interactions accessible in other ways to support that process. Um, so in addition to the meeting that we're holding now, there's going to be several digital tools that we're going to employ as part of this effort, um, many of which we've had great success with in other projects like the one you're seeing here that we've sort of moved out of this phase into a more digital one. Um, Nick and Amy are going to talk a little bit more in detail about what some of those tools might look like and how you can you and other members of the communities will be able to access this information um, and how we'll be able to then hear from you on a more frequent basis. Um, so thanks again. Thank you all for joining us. We're anxious to hear more from you throughout this process and we look forward to uh, to the future for Pierce Park 3. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, really appreciate the the thought and the insight here. Uh, we've got a couple questions coming through the chat. If you want to, if you have a question or idea or a thought that you want to share, feel free to put it in the chat. If you kind of want to talk uh, through with the group, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and we can call on folks here in just a minute. Uh, again, if you hit the participants button uh, at, at the bottom of your screen there, it should give you the option to raise your hand and Amy here will we'll work with some of those questions here in just a minute. Um, but I uh, did just want to reiterate the point that Chris just made that this will certainly not be our last uh, opportunity for, for input and engagement. Uh, and in fact, in addition to all of the different meetings and activities that we as trustees will be hosting, we also have a lot of plans to, to be active participants in some of the other meetings that uh, you and your community are taking place. So we really appreciate uh, the opportunity and the invitation to, to speak with a number of the different uh, neighborhood groups, as, as I mentioned earlier, and that you could see listed here. Um, and we're going to continue to visit those neighborhood associations and in community meetings and uh, setting up additional public input meetings like the one that we have this evening. Uh, in the coming weeks and months, um, that will have a number of different options for design review. Um, hopefully, we'll be much more interactive, as, as Chris also said. Uh, from, uh, you know, how, how do we gather around and get feedback, but um, given our current circumstances, we're going to do everything that we can to find a way to um, get as much feedback from as many different diverse viewpoints as possible. Um, so if, with that said, if, if there are any groups or organizations that you'd like to have us come speak at, neighborhood associations or otherwise, uh, we'd be happy to do that. You can uh, certainly get in touch with us. Uh, we do have a website, onewaterfront.org, 
that you can go to, or you can also email onewaterfront at thetrustees.org, or you can also just email uh, myself or Amy directly. Well, we'll put that information in the chat for for folks uh, to to have as well, because we we definitely want to make sure that that um, you are engaged. Uh, just a few quick uh, additional highlights uh, on the website, which uh, we're continually building out and adding things to. First and foremost, we have a, a, a blog um, that we keep regularly update uh, updated. Christine Boynton's our, our communications point on uh, that process, and she does a really great job of uh, keeping people up to date. So if you want to just follow our progress, uh, I would encourage you to, again, go to onewaterfront.org slash blog. You can check out the blog. You can also sign up to receive email updates there. Uh, we've also have up a, a community bulletin board right now. Uh, which asks a simple question, uh, what would you like to see at uh, Pierce Park Phase 3? And it gives you the opportunity just to uh, type in a response and post it up on the bulletin board. Those will all be public. People can interact with those. Uh, in, in the very uh, near term, we'll also have a community feedback survey that we'll be circulating uh, to everyone who participated this evening, who signed up to, to participate. Uh, we'll be seeking more in-depth feedback uh, to get a better sense of uh, what people would like to see here, what the uses would be. Um, and then we'll also be doing some other fun things as well. So uh, I see questions pouring in. I like to see that. We'll get to those in just a second. Uh, before we do that, I want to ask one more poll question just to give you a chance to ask some of those questions. Um, what are the aspects of, Pierce, of the Pierce Park 3 design that will be most important to you? Uh, is it the connection to Pierce Park phase one and two? Is it access to the harbor? Is it resilience in response to sea level rise? Is it creation of natural habitat? Or is it space to socialize? Again, what do you feel is the most important to you? And of course, many of you are screaming, but I wanna vote all of the above, or I wanna vote for something else. I understand that, but we're asking you to give us what, an answer to one of these four questions just to spark some thought and debate, just to see which um, rises to the top. Um, good to see access to the harbor, not surprised to see that one. That's one of the things that we hear quite often from people when we're talking about um, elements that they would like to see is access to the waterfront. Uh, in, in recent time, we have seen a few additional access points built in East Boston, but largely throughout the city of Boston, there's very limited ways you can get down to the harbor walk and you can look out over the water, but there's really isn't too many ways to engage there. Uh, resilience and response to sea level rise, that's an important one, particularly for this site. For those of you who followed the Climate Ready Boston process, uh, you know that this is a particular vulnerable area in a particularly vulnerable neighborhood. So that's definitely something that we're thinking about and focused on uh, in the weeks and months to come. Uh, so with that, um, we're, we're here to answer questions and, and hear feedback. And so, um, uh, we'll start there. Uh, Amy, if there are any questions you want to highlight in the chat first, um, and then if anyone else wants to raise their hand, and uh, we can call on you and, and, and hear your thoughts and, and feedback. Yeah, we've got a couple questions already. I see that David is asking about whether there's funding in place for the park. Sure. Uh, so the trustees is uh, going to be raising all of the capital construction costs to build this park. Um, we don't know how much it's gonna cost yet because we haven't designed it, obviously, as Chris just said. Um, so what we build there is obviously gonna end up um, determining how much it's gonna cost. But to date, we do have over $20 million in committed pledges to this park. Um, we think it may cost anywhere between 20 and $40 million, depending upon the, the design and how we end up um, but we're, we're determined to, to raise as much money as we can to, to help build this park and then work with Massport in terms of how we, we operate and, and maintain it going forward. But thanks for the question, David. Yeah, I have another question here from Isaac asking, uh, I think this is probably one for Chris, are there any overall lessons learned from Martin's Park project that MVVNA would implement for Pierce Park 3? Yeah, I mean, I think just the experience of working along a, a tidal waterfront where the fluctuation is so great. I mean, on a daily basis, it, the difference between high and low tide is greater than 10 feet, which is is really, really significant when you're talking about 
a landscape. You know, Martin's Park is sort of lifted above the water, but we're talking about, you know, th where we're thinking about landscapes that might engage the water and provide points of access. Um, so doing that in a, in a tidal range that's greater than 10 feet currently is, is a significant challenge, but one that we're, we're totally up for. Um, so I think that that's really the most critical thing that we were sort of thinking about relative to this project and lessons from, from Martin's Park. Question from Tom Bruno, whether there are any restrictions on the design of the park? Um, only in its, its, its physical construction, I, I think is, is the biggest question is what can we actually build there? I mean, obviously we can't, we're, we're, our goal is to stay within the footprint of the current pier. We're not going to build outside of that. Um, it's a, th there's still a big question in terms of whether this is a landform that gets built into the water or if it's, you know, some, some sort of pier that gets built on, on top of what exists. Um, those are all questions that are going to be, you know, answered as we move forward in the design process in terms of what people would like to see there. But what people would like to see there is going to be governed by what we can build there. Um, and so we do have to be thoughtful about it, not only um, what people want to see, but what we can get permitted, for example, uh, and, and have uh, actually built in the harbor. So those are all good questions and, and ones that were still sort of early stages. We do feel like we have enough confidence to move forward that we can build something. Um, and so that's why we are here tonight, because we are intent on doing that. Uh, but in terms of what exactly it looks like and what the limitations are going to be, I think that's going to be a question that is answered as, as we evolve through this process. So thank you for the okay. question. We've got a question from Heather about uh, whether we have any thoughts about making the park dog friendly. That's a good question. Um, I think that's something, so it, which also speaks to the larger question about programming and, and what actually happens in this park. And that's a big piece of this, not of this design process, um, which is to say um, what happens at the park and what programs are, are going to be there are going to be largely dependent upon what you and the community are advocating for. Um, we, we are going to have to, you know, come to a usage agreement with both Massport and the Pierce Pack um, uh, on terms of the overall usage of the park. And so that's, you know, something that will have to be discussed in those forums as well. Um, but if that is something that people feel strongly about, I'd, I'd encourage you to participate in this process, continue to give us that feedback, and then we'll, we'll also pass it along to, to Massport and the PAC as well. Great. We've got a question from Nikki asking, when you say access to the water, does this imply that swimming will be available? That's also a, a, a issue or a question up for debate. We've heard from a lot of people that there is interest in, in swimming there. Um, uh, it's also you know, a pretty busy spot in terms of uh, boat traffic. And so it's, it's a question of uh, access and safety first and foremost. Um, but when we talk about access, really it, it's about being able to get down and, and get your toes in the water in a safe and, and secure manner and, and being able to interact with some of that habitat and wildlife that Chris was talking about. And so, uh, again, if, if swimming is something that is strongly advocated for, and we feel like, um, you know, that can be done safely, that that's a conversation that, that we'll have to have with, with the community and others in terms of what happens there. But, um, uh, it's it's certainly something we've heard before, and it's it's good to note that that's of interest here. Great, Karen Madalena is asking, will you be charging for some events held at Piers Park Three? I think that ultimately depends upon what the programming looks like um, in the park itself. I mean, our first and our foremost objective is to make sure that we're providing high quality programming that people are interested in participating in. Um, certainly some of those programs would come without a cost and um, make sure that we want to have as much access to people as possible. Uh, those programs that do have a cost uh, as a nonprofit organization, we will uh, be taking all of those funds and, and putting them back into the operations and maintenance of the park itself. And so any of those costs would be associated with the ongoing support of the park rather than, you know, going off someplace else. But thanks for the question, Karen, and good to see you. 
Great. I've got uh, another question here. Can you help us understand how Pierce Park 2 and Pierce Park 3 are related? What contingencies the 2 project has on the 3 project, which is related actually to another question coming in from Emily, um, one of our waterfront ambassadors this past summer, actually past two summers, who's wondering, will construction close the current Pierce Park for a while and will the parks be connected so you can get from each one to the other? Uh, so the phasing of construction is, is obviously a big question here. Um, and if Anthony wants to pop on and talk about phase two at all, I, I would welcome him to do so. Um, that is definitely some piece of uh, coordination that's going to have to take place with us in Massport as well as the community. We want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable with the construction plan so we're not overwhelming the neighborhood with dump trucks of dirt or, or, or whatever uh, might occur there. So um, it, it is something that we stay in close contact with and we'll figure out as we uh, start to um, get some more specific, uh, specific thoughts around the design itself and then once we've got a design, then we can we can really figure out the specifics around construction. But I see Anthony. Do you want to add anything to that? Oh, can you unmute Anthony, Amy? Nick, that's right. Thank you. Um, I think that you know there'll be a lot of planning that we'll have to do with that neighborhood, and then with the pack and with the trustees, as to you know everything that's involved with any major construction project, truck traffic noise abatement and so forth and so on. Um, what we see is, is that phase two hopefully will be in construction and that will co coincide with one another. Um, so it, we'll, we'll make it work like we've done with other projects. And I think that working with the trustees, we will be coming out to the community with periodic updates on that construction process. Um. I'm also just scanning along here, taking Amy's job here. That actually, there, there's an interesting point that was made here by Michael Vieira that I just wanted to make sure everyone saw. But uh, Michael put in the chat here, the most think that all immigrants arrive through Ellis Island, but are for our Portuguese, Italians, and others, Boston is our Ellis Island. And I don't think there's any marker or sign that lets people know that. I believe this pier is close, close to where my family arrived from the Azores. It might be a good place to educate and commemorate this historic port of entry. Could not agree with you more, Michael. That's one of the, I showed you one picture of the Boston waterfront or East Boston waterfront from 1925. I found a whole treasure trove of them uh, in the Massachusetts State Archives, some of which featured steamer ships that were parked alongside that presumably had people immigrating to this country. Of course, the Golden Staircase is in that uh, section of the neighborhood that, go, that goes right up into East Boston. So. That's exactly what we're talking about when we want to talk about the history and the story of this place that we're very interested in, in hearing from. So thank you for sharing that story. And also want to encourage others, um, if you have old photos or if you have stories of, of your family arriving, please get in touch with us. That, that's definitely something that um, as a 130-year-old nonprofit, um, you can imagine we have a whole archive department that, that spends a lot of time studying all of the history of these places. And so... Uh, they're very, also very excited to hear those stories as well. So um, that'll certainly be a part of this process. Thanks for showing, sharing. We've got a question from John Walkie about whether the water sheet to the west is considered part of the park. Water sheet to the west. If you're talking about between Roseland, the Roseland Pier and, and our pier, um, I mean, I think that would be... A, something that may potentially see some activation depending upon where like for example a kayak launch landed i mean i think um if that's something people were, were interested in doing um the actual footprint or sort of scope if, of work if, if you will is limited to the the footprint of the pier itself though um we have a question also about um, access to the park and whether we've thought about coordinating ferry service with the ICA watershed or just, you know, generally thinking more about water transportation versus parking. Yeah, for sure. It's an ongoing conversation and I'm just glancing over at the, the participants box and seeing Alice Brown's on uh, our own resident Harbor ferry expert. Hi, Alice. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I think expanding access through water transportation at this site and for the East Boston neighborhood in general 
is a is an excellent objective. Um, you know, the ICA has had that shuttle for the last couple summers uh, to give access to the watershed. Um, the city recently completed its um, ferry dock at Lewis Mall, which is about a quarter of a mile away from this site, um, which would um, uh, give better access um, from a, a larger vessel, more than just you know a little a water transportation taxis that were we they'd be able to to take on water ferries there. So, oh look, Alice says Lewis Mall. So I got the answer right. I'm proud of myself for that. So yeah, no, I I think um, the um, expanding water access to the site and connectivity for the neighborhood is is certainly something we're in favor of and we'll be we supportive of as we um, advance in this project. Yeah, I also have a question about um, Piers PAC role in design. I guess it looks like folks are asking, can we share how people can get involved with the PAC um, as that, you know, continues? Yeah, so uh, the Pierce PAC is the, is the governing body that uh, officially represents the community to Massport on all of the open space in East Boston. Um, they have uh, monthly meetings, I believe every third Tuesday of the month um, that are open to the public. Uh, the most recent ones have, have been conducted in a similar manner on, on Zoom. Uh, so I think it's, it's just a matter of, of going, uh, you can just Google the East Boston Pierce PAC um, find their website and um, they they post links to their meetings monthly as well, usually a, a follow up uh, meeting minutes summary the following month. And so you can see both of those there. But yeah, I mean, there the, the pack is, is certainly um, a, a, an entity that um, is, is going to play a role here. We want to make sure that um, folks are you know feel heard and represented there so if if you are available and, and want to participate in the back meetings i would certainly encourage you to do that they are open to the public we also had a question um, from our facebook live asking if the presentation would be available online after tonight which i can answer we will be posting it on our blog so if you um, check out the website i put it in the chat and i can put it in there again in a couple of minutes um, We'll be posting the video, posting the video from tomorrow's meeting in Spanish as well. Um, so you can come back or share it with others who didn't make it tonight. Hello, Facebook. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. We've, it looks like we've got a little bit of a lag in the questions. I might put up my, um, I have a last poll question here. Okay. Tell us about your relationship to East Boston. We probably should have added a, I would like to establish a relationship with East Boston event or per, per, previously have one, but hopefully we can convert you non-park users into East Boston engagers as well. Good to see so many East Boston residents. Again, you know, this is something that we think of as a uh, a project that's going to be vitally important to the neighborhood uh, moving forward. Um, we do also see it, though, as, as a project for, for all of Boston. I think there's a good opportunity here to, to create something really new and spectacular uh, that uh, Boston can be very proud of. Uh, I think we can uh, really establish ourselves in terms of um, the resiliency elements and finding ways to uh, solve the issues that we're facing with storm surge, sea level rise, monthly tidal flooding along not just our East Boston waterfront, but, but the city as a whole. Uh, these types of green infrastructure projects and living shorelines and natural edges, you know, we think they're, are, are going to be really important for the future of the city. And, and this is a project that we think is, uh, can be a real good proof of concept to, to really test drive some of those options and see what, um, uh, what we can do together to, to really make a spectacular place that people want to be on a sunny day, uh, but that protects us on a day that isn't quite so sunny um, and in fact, quite stormy. How are we doing on question? Looks like we might have a couple more. 
Someone asked how to access the virtual bulletin board. I put in the link for our website. I'm not sure if our virtual bulletin board is actually live yet or if it's going live tomorrow, but it will be there shortly if it's not there now. And there are other ways to engage right now um, and more coming very soon. Yeah, again, I would encourage you just to check out the website, onewaterfront.org, sign up for the blog. Um, you just get one email a week. It's usually one or two blog posts. Uh, some good update on the projects, uh, some things that we're reading and following, learning about other parks that inspire us, things that we're learning from others, uh, other places. And so it's a, it's a really good sort of window into uh, how we're doing on this project. And of course, always welcome people's feedback and thoughts. Uh, we wanna make sure that um, this is a real participatory process. Obviously, we'd love to be in a, in a room together. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to figuring out how Chris is gonna get everyone around a virtual model uh, to, to get feedback from folks, because I think that's something that we definitely want to do here uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. But um, um, otherwise, you know, really, really glad to have everyone's participation. Um, we are hitting about the top of the hour here. Are there any other questions we should address in the chat? I don't want to run over and, and take the mayor's time and, and interrupt his state of the city address. So. Um, we have just two others came in now. Um, one from someone who joined late asking what uh, what Pier 2 is all about. I think maybe what is Piers Park 2 about, if you want to give it just a quick, a quick um, reminder. And then one other question about um, whether the treasure trove of older East Boston photos are available um, to folks online. Yeah, so the, the Mass Archives has a great uh, digital um archive section that uh you can just go to their website and like literally just i just typed in east boston and um found thousands of photos from you know probably the last 300 years uh to be to be perfectly honest it, it's a real fascinating look to see how this neighborhood was would grew and was literally built in a lot of ways um and, and how it developed and then how the uses along the waterfront changed and how early on those railroad tracks went in there and then how the usage uh, changed once there were other changes and other economic factors around uh, the transportation of grain from the Midwest and the St. St. Lawrence Riverway, things like that. And so there's there's a lot of you know fascinating history and story to tell here, but um, um, it, it's a really uh, interesting look. So yeah, if you just go to the, the Massachusetts Commonwealth Archives, I believe it's called, um, you, can, you can search through those and take a look at that. I think Emily's setting me up here. Uh, this is a good question. How do you plan on reaching all or most of the people in East Boston? This, this is definitely something that is a, a goal of ours. Uh, as Amy mentioned, Emily's taken part in our Waterfront Ambassador program for the last two years and is, is a really great uh, youth advocate for the work that we're doing. Uh, the Waterfront Ambassadors did a great job this summer of coming up with some engagement opportunities. They help circulate a, a survey for the East Boston Greenway, the Mary Ellen Welsh Greenway, uh, to get some feedback on their expansion uh, efforts and opportunities. And, and we'll be certainly employing them to do the same, but we're also gonna be looking to bring on um, uh, additional voices to help us find non-conventional ways and non-digital ways. Because I mean, frankly, you know, this works for a lot of people to, to log on at six o'clock in the evening, but not everyone feels comfortable getting on a Zoom call. and so. Uh, we want to get that community survey out to as many folks as possible and that, you know, whether that takes place in an analog form or door hangers or mailers or whatever, we're, we're looking at a number of different options. But um, it's our uh, our goal to, to, to get as much feedback as possible because it's really valuable to us, as Chris said at the top, to, to, to really understand what people want to see here. And a lot of the best ideas that will come out of this park are not going to come from us. Uh, they'll come from you. And so we really appreciate everyone taking the time to participate uh, in that this evening. Uh, any other final pieces? Great. Well, again, uh, very grateful for everyone taking the time tonight. This is really, we see as, as the beginning of this process to kick off, uh, we'll be seeing hopefully much more of each other in the coming weeks and months as, as we talk about what our opportunities are, how we build this together. Uh, and, and, and how we work together. So really appreciate everyone taking the time this evening and um, look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. So thanks again.
Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to more, more engaging dialogue in our coming meetings. Appreciate your coming.